tonight the birth of a new airliner. Today the British Aerospace 146 made its first public appearance as it was rolled out of its hangar at Hatfield in Hertfordshire. In his third report on the building of the 146, Bernard Clark looks at the plane makers, the men with the reputation of the British aircraft industry in their hands. Today they rolled out the 146, a quaint procedure, the first time it's shown to the public. But more important, perhaps, today the Civil Aircraft Division of British Aerospace also held a press conference. Air Wisconsin, uh, a major uh, US uh, regional carrier, have just decided to buy four aircraft and take an option on a further four. Uh, the US operator West Air have just announced board approval to purchase six with options on a further eight. A modest order, but significant, because the 146 has yet to make its first flight, a sign of confidence that the aircraft will perform as British Aerospace say it will, and that British workers can still build a competitive aircraft. British Aerospace Hatfield is at first sight an ordinary jumble of buildings, 1930 Art Deco, with a dozen or more functional hangars spread around in disregard of any obvious order. In the centre is a runway, the only certain sign that Hatfield makes aircraft. Through the gate goes metal, plastic and paper, but that's not the real raw material. This is what makes aircraft people, thousands of them coming and going gradually forging an airliner from their craftsmanship and ideas. The aircraft is built in stages, first on paper on the drawing board, what you might call the optimistic view, how it should be given a perfect world. Next it's built on computer. Although at this stage, the how they see it in the drawing office stage, no one takes too much notice. The computer tapes will be filed for future changes. The work proper starts on the carpentry bench. You're not seeing things. The aircraft really is being made of wood. All this work will be either burned, thrown away, or end up in a small museum. But not just yet. For the moment, the wooden mock-up is of the greatest importance. Lord, what's the point of making a wooden mock-up? Well, it's to save a lot of waste of time wasting good material. If we make it out of wood, it's far less price, far less cost than what it would be to waste the metal. What sort of things do you discover making the wooden mock-up, then? Well, well, the biggest things we discover is where, where we go wrong, the big errors we make before we, before we um, make the proper one. What sort of things, like a pipe won't fit through? Well, it, that is correct, yes. It will fail perhaps a, a bulkhead. Although it's drawn out on drawings, it doesn't always prove exactly right. It has to be checked and checked again with a mock-up. 200 yards away, the operating problems are being smoothed away by another important member of the aircraft building team, the test pilot, in a wooden mock-up of the cockpit. If they do go, if they don't turn out quite as expected, then this gives us an ideal opportunity to recommend an alternative location which would be more convenient, and it's rather easier to do that with a three-dimensional space model than just doing it on paper. The test pilot is not what legend has him to be. His flying qualifications are, of course, the highest. That much is taken for granted. But he's so much more. He's the guinea pig behind every control. It's his job to make it an aircraft that will feel right to every pilot, an aircraft that will fly uh, well. As you know, I've recently been assessing the rudder pedal geometry in the mock-up, mm -hmm. and uh, I found that the plane in which 
the pedals move is inclined to the floor such that when I deflect the rudder bar, my heels tend to catch on the floor. And this could lead to uh, an inadvertent application of asymmetric brake. Well, because of jamming because under of the, your heel. Because the heel actually catches on the floor and then my ankle tilts forward. Uh, the design team will have these inputs coming back. Alter this, change that. Every square millimetre comes under examination. The uh, design uh, department took the necessary action and in fact changed the shape of the floor so that one's heel no longer tended to be trapped and that you can just see if you uh, press your foot underneath the uh, rudder pedal there you'll find yeah. that the floor has been chamfered away gently yes, so that uh, in fact as you move the rudder pedals there's no longer a problem. Is it all trial and error? Well it's, it's not so much trial and error it's a, a process of iteration you try a particular uh, compromise of design you will then stress it weigh it in the weights department and it might all be wrong and it might not be quite right so then you alter various areas and then you try it again and you continually go on doing this until you get the best balance there's no one area that you can get absolutely right you have to get the best balance so That's the whole thing important. is a compromise the whole thing is a compromise yes it certainly is it's a compromise against cost against weight against performance and against manufacturing techniques the detail is frightening and that's where the computers come in. Twenty years ago, every change meant a whole new set of drawings. Now it's just the flick of a switch to slightly amend the tape. This computer, properly programmed, will do the work of 50 people in a tenth of the time. The final design, now on tape, is transferred to another computer in the cutting shop. Huge parts of the aircraft can now be sheared into shape without the touch of a human hand. To watch this machine automatically grinding out an aircraft to within a thousandth of a centimeter is to realize the enormous impact of technology. Instantly it's apparent why it costs 250 million pounds to develop. The grinding equipment, the computers, the aluminium, and above all the people. A thousand people cost 10 million pounds a year and an aircraft needs many thousand working on it simply to get the first one built. Now with the advent of computer-aided design where we can actually draw these parts on the computer and then transfer that data into an NC, that's a numerically controlled milling machine, then the milling machine can cut out this part exactly as the designer draws it. So the whole thing can be done more or less by computer? Well, it can. The, the process can be certainly speeded up through computers, but you have to have the designer thinking through each stage. The object is to use the computer to turn the draftsman's pencil into a machine cutter. While the heavier aircraft structure is chiselled, the more flexible parts are worn into shape, again without the touch of humans. Transfers to the required design are stuck onto sheets of aluminium, which are then submerged in baths of acid. The treatment lasts only a short time until just the protected pieces are left intact. This sheet will be part of the fuselage. If you, by accident, fell into the tank, all they'd find of you is the zip. 